はい、それではお時間となりましたので、本日最後の講演、キーノートを始めさせていただきます。えー、ゲストはですね、えー、デボプスデイズをの創設者であります、パトリック・デボアさん、えー、また、インタビュー、スタッフとして、えー、アレックス・パパディモリスが参加させていただきます。お二人ともどうぞよろしくお願いいたします。Ah, thank you very much.、Um, and welcome, Patrick. It is、uh, great to see you. This is the first interview style that I've done、um, like this with sort of you there on the screen and、um, everybody else remote as well. But、uh, thank you so much for,、um, for coming. I think almost everybody here knows who you are, but can you give a sort of self introduction? Sure, Alex.、Uh, and thank you for having me.、Um, I really like、uh, to be here in the community uh, uh, of DevOps Days.、Uh, about 11 years ago in 2009,、uh, I started by accident、uh, the DevOps Days、uh, events.、Uh, I'm now about 50 years old. As you can see, I have gray hair. Uh, fr not from running these events, but just、uh, being longer in the industry.、Um, I live in Belgium um, and uh, I'm currently in Belgium, so it's a privilege for me to present uh, from Belgium uh, to you.、Um, the way how I came to DevOps was that I changed every three, four years、um, kind of my role. And my domain. So I've been a tester, I've been a developer, I've been a, a service manager, I, I've been many of those roles. And、um, every time I was in one of those roles,、uh, they think you cannot do the other one. And then by having all that experience,、um, I really wanted to have Dev and Ops collaborate more. So A lot of people know you as the inventor of DevOps. Is, is that a fair title?、Uh, you said you accidentally started DevOps. That, that doesn't sound like inventing it.、Uh, how, how, did you, how did you come about creating DevOps from all of these different roles that you experienced? So there's、um, a couple of Different、uh, threads that came together.、Um, one has been that I was working with agile teams. One has been that I was、uh, looking at、uh, John Allspaw's presentation、uh, where they gave a talk at Etsy how Dev and Ops were collaborating.、Uh, and I was seeing similar things happening from that was happening in the agile community and that. Was happening in the system and administrating、uh, world.、Um, I always say I did not invent it. It was just a lot of different people trying to do things differently, trying to do things more humane.、Um, and I just happened to be the person who kind of labeled it.、Uh, the funny story was that I was looking for a name of this conference. And because Agile System Administration Days is too hard and too long, I said, oh, let's call it DevOps Days. And I also found it,、uh, a joke on being DOD, dead on delivery, if you <laughs> kind of take all the, you know, the parts and, of the letters.、Um, I did not invent anything. I Kind of see myself as connecting some of the dots. And then most of all, I amplified a lot of the stories.、Uh, and that made me a DevOps enthusiast.、Um, some have also called me、uh, the DevOps godfather.、Uh, and recently is becoming the DevOps father. And that is mostly because I do take credit for getting a lot of people together. And making people enthusiastic about it.、Uh, 
so in that sense, I did not invent it, but I was, you know, a kind of a supporter uh, from the early days and kind of uh, make sure uh, we kept having new ideas and new content at these events. So what was really interesting is you said that the word DevOps came from the name of a conference. Are you saying that you came up with the word DevOps because you needed a name for a conference? Uh, the true story is that I actually did not think about the word DevOps. Uh, I only came up with the title of the conference called it DevOps Days. We got about the first DevOps days got about 60 people from all over the world. We had people from Australia, from New Zealand, from um, England, from France, from Germany. Um, and they all came through Twitter, through the social thing. Um, and it was only after the, the, the two days, uh, Stephen Nelson Smith wrote a blog post that was called, uh, what is this DevOps thing anyway? So before that, I, I didn't even realize myself, DevOps was gonna be a movement, was gonna be a word. But people were so enthusiastic um, after the first event that they wanted to organize uh, the same events across the world. And that, that is how the word DevOps kind of became a meaning uh, after the conference had happened. So before there was even no idea that it should be an industry term. So that explains a lot for why it's such a community driven um, concept, DevOps. Um, but you know, you mentioned that that never really had a definition. I feel that a lot of people have tried to define DevOps over over the years. Um, you know, you say that you didn't create a definition. It was kind of the name of a conference, but as the person who created the conference, who sort of started the movement, um, what what does DevOps mean to you? Yes, the, the definition uh, of DevOps is, is uh, an interesting story. Um, I already mentioned I have gray hair. So that means I already lived through uh, previous ideas uh, like Agile and ITIL and before there were others. Um, and ITIL at that time had around 11 books and people still mistake what it meant, even if somebody wrote like 11 books and it was not clear after 11 books what it should be. Uh, and then Agile Manifesto kind of had the one pager with kind of all the explanations and the same problem existed. People didn't understand the original meaning. It kind of got changed over time what the meaning was and I, I kind of deliberately did not want to define it myself. I know a lot of people wanted to define it, but my the reasons why I did not want to do that is I think once you define something on paper, it people can mistake uh, and have the dispute on what it is. Uh, and I always wanted to keep it growing for new ideas. I did not want to make this a closed definition uh, that people could mistake for. That has made a lot of people's jobs difficult when they have to explain what DevOps is, I think. Um, but it's good because, as you said, it allows for evolving. Um, is DevOps technology? A lot of people say DevOps is this tech or that tech. Uh, do you, you know, is it something you consider a technology solution like that? So 11 years later, I, I think I made a definition for myself <laughs> um, in a way that uh, for me, DevOps is about removing the friction between silos. Um, and all the rest I call engineering. 
and I, I, that means that you can use technology to overcome part of the friction, but you can also just use technology for the technology. So technology alone will not be enough to kind of solve this. Um, but removing that friction is still there. And that I think is kind of the systems view of DevOps, whether the, you know, the, the friction is between dev and ops, or maybe it is in your finance, maybe it's in your HR, maybe it is somewhere else. Uh, that removing that friction uh, due to the fact that we created silos, that is the most important. So when people say to me, I have done configuration management or I have built a CI pipeline. I am now a DevOps engineer. I always ask them, so how does it help to bridge the silo? And mm -hmm. I sometimes have this fun when I go at conferences and I go to the booths of vendors, but how does your product overcome a silo? And then they have a really hard time explaining this how the technology will be used to actually bridge the gap. Uh, so that's why I keep coming back. If you're using the technology to build the, the gap, then yes, you might be doing DevOps, but it, it is regardless to what technology you are using. But if you're bridging the gap, then that is the focus of what I think DevOps is uh, as such. So you're saying DevOps really goes a lot beyond just dev, the development teams and the operations team, and perhaps even behind technology itself, like it's not even necessarily a friction of IT? Correct. Um, I did not have that IT when 11 years ago. 11 years ago, the biggest friction in companies was between the devs delivering something to the production environment. So the collaboration between the dev and the ops. If you look at DevOps as a systems uh, view of the company, that means once you solve one bottleneck, there is another bottleneck in the same company. Uh, for example, imagine you're working well together with your dev and the ops people, and you think we have a good a good team, but there is a hiring policy that is really blocking you to hire good people. Uh, maybe they, they do not screen on collaboration or the social skills. That means the bottleneck is now outside of your dev and ops team, but is in the hiring team. Um, imagine you're doing everything well in your pipeline and you're delivering really well uh, but you do not have a business case and you are not making money. That means mm. maybe you are over engineering and spending too much time on your dev and ops and your CI pipeline at not looking at the real bottleneck, which is the business. So that's how I learned that even if you would have the perfect pipeline, the perfect dev and ops, it is still not a guarantee for success because we need to collaborate also with other parts of the business. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I have been following a lot of your writing and a lot of your, you know, talks for many years. I, I remember, you know, obviously not, not since the beginning, but even five years ago, maybe six years ago, um, it felt like you talked a little bit differently, like you had a stronger focus on technology, um, tools, and maybe it was the industry in some of those early conferences. Has your definition or your understanding of DevOps changed over the years? I do not think um, my personal definition or my personal focus has changed, uh, but I, I think I have tried to be more vocal on the cultural part uh, more, just because it, I think it is the important part. Um, and that's maybe why you see the narrative, but I have, I do not have many, so I, I do have technical talks, but regarding if I explain things in the DevOps context, 
you will have a hard time really finding um, a talk from me uh, just on the technology. Uh, I was always show you how a certain technology will overcome some of the friction. Uh, and that, that's kind of how I may, uh, try to make this difference. Um, it does not mean that I'm not a technical person. <laughs> and I also like to dig into the technical uh, things and how they, they work together. Uh, but I, I think it is important to distinguish both of them. Um, and maybe coming back to DevOps days, um, in a lot of conferences that I personally helped with, I always want to have in the morning only social talks and not technical talks. Uh, if you look at the submission process, there would be uh, 70 or 80% of the submissions for people talking would be about techn technology. But I always remain very firmly that in the morning, there should be social talks of people collaborating and showing how technology can be used to bridge the gap. And then the breakouts would be used to kind of discuss the technology. You know, we, and I think that's a great way of, uh, of organizing these. We worked hard in Tokyo. We restarted DevOps days um, in 2017. Years before that, there was a highly technical focused version of, of the event. And then, uh, you know, our, our team restarted it because it didn't get a lot of interest on that. Um, here in Japan, our focus has very strongly been on the, on the cultural aspect because changing the culture here especially is difficult to do. Um, one criticism that I hear from, um, you know, whether it's Japanese organizations or whether it's even overseas companies, they talk a lot about how, well, DevOps is just some hype. DevOps is just a buzzword. Um, DevOps isn't really going to change anything. It's just hype. H how do you feel about people who say that DevOps is a hype? Um, I think DevOps is not different from any other ID. Um, that means you will have early adopters then there will be some excited, uh, excitement about this ID. Uh, then more people get attracted. Um, and then there's going to be a lot of marketing around it because it changes how you know it becomes like a, a way to make money. Uh, and then it opens up to an either an even wider audience. Um, I've certainly seen this over the 11 years that um, you know, from a small group to a whole industry to a massive industry, how it kind of progressed. Um, I think uh, about five, five years ago, uh, everybody had DevOps on their website, on their kind of uh, way of working, on their products. Uh, in that way, it is a probably you would call this a hype. You know, everybody wants to be on this train, not the early adopters. Um, I don't worry about it too much, whether it's hype or not. Um, I've taken peace with it that it is, the IDs will remain. Um, it makes me a little bit sad that, well, the, the original intent is sometimes lost. Uh, I think the industry has settled on DevOps being the automation group. Uh, and obviously that's not what it was intended, but I take comfort in uh, Agile has been uh, reduced to Scrum. ITIL has been reduced to ticketing yeah. systems. Um, so does that make it less valuable? Not for the people who use it correctly and understand what it means. It will have very much value. Uh, I do not have any shares. I do not have a company um, that relies on DevOps as such. Um, so I have taken peace with it. Um, I know some people have said it's already dead <laughs> as mm. a term. 
uh, I, uh, most vocally has been Simon Wardley from Wardley Mapping, who said DevOps is dead. Uh, I know people have tried to reduce it to the idea of no ops. Why do we need ops anymore? Um, from my personal experience, um, I think that um, I had my own company for a while and we were really focused, you know, I was really interested in learning how DevOps could help the company. Um, and after a while, we said, we're just going to use a lot of the services. We're going to use Amazon. We're not going to do our own monitoring. We're, we're just going to use everything that's out there because they have the scale, they have the knowledge, they have the time, they have the budget to do it way better than we can do it ourselves in the in a little startup. Um, even if you give all those tasks away or you abstract kind of the technology layers, what I found out is you're still doing ops again, but at a different layer. So we used to do management of servers. Now we're managing our Kubernetes cluster. Then we're managing our AWS. Then we're managing our Salesforce. And all of these tasks will require understanding of what the product does, how it functions, how it functions under pressure, what special settings we need to do, and it is just changing at what layer we're doing the operational side, but the concept of operations will not go away. Uh, you can see already, for example, marketing has marketing ops, right? So it, it, will, it, it is not even related to per se technology. It, it is just a notion that will stay there forever. And that collaboration friction between people dealing with the keeping the things up versus keep people creating kind of the features is everywhere in a company. Yeah, we we see, you know, even even in Japan, the word ops just attached to so many things. Um, you know, I've uh, you mentioned no ops before. And, uh, you know, Dev SecOps is becoming a new word. Dev test sec ops I've been seeing. Um, is there a relation between all of these ops movements? Do they have a formal definitions or are they also kind of all working towards closing or bridging gaps between silos? A, a lot of the terms are around um more on the technology side, uh, doing things in a different way. Um, what, what is interesting, uh, I, I have seen so many terms. I have seen front-end ops, I've seen design ops. Uh, now we have ML ops, AI ops. Uh, and th the way that I look at them is they're all labels to convey a new way of working, a new ID, a new concept, a new problem space. So we should not look at them as being the next thing or being better than the previous thing. Uh, we should just look at them as groups of stories that we can learn from. Uh, and I think that is the value that the word DevOps has had early on is everybody was exploring new ideas, new concepts, new collaboration ways. We got a label, so that made it very easy to get the stories to be searchable uh, and to find the similar minded people. Uh, and the same has happened now with DevSecOps. You know, enough people have got an idea how to make this better. They're experimenting with this. And now it serves as a label um, to, to kind of find those stories. Does that mean um, DevSecOps needs a new term? Uh, and is it different from DevOps? No, you could say the collaboration between silos is the same. We're just doing it for uh, security now. Uh, but then again, uh, is DevOps not the same as Agile? Uh, yes, it is. Um, it is funny how this grew because before you know the term DevOps, I went to a lot of agile conferences and I tried to kind of explain the ideas. 
and I never somehow uh, conveyed my message until I created a new silo, which was a new conference, which was new DevOps days, which was not an agile conference uh, as it was known at that time. So um, I, I think you may have just lost me for a second. You're saying that the idea of DevOps, which is to bridge silos, couldn't have existed until you created the word. That kind of sounds like a bit of a paradox to me. Is this, is this a trend you see in our industry, this sort of paradoxical existence of words and ideas? Oh, uh, Alex, uh, paradoxes are, uh, are everywhere. Um, like one of the first paradoxes I learned in the industry is um, it's called the irony of automation. Uh, so the, the more you automate, the idea that we all think is, is very valuable. Um, we think we are getting better at things and we're getting, uh, you know, we can deliver faster and so on. But the flip side is when these things fail and we've never done them manually, we never trained in them, um, we don't know anymore how to do it. And we don't even know anymore why we did the automation sometimes. Uh, and when it fails, uh, that means, well, we automated, but we didn't get better at it when it failed. Uh, so we, we still have to train on it. Um, another paradox is similar to DevSecOps or security. Imagine you have uh, a, a vulnerability and you, you you kind of have a major information leak. Uh, that is the perfect time to get money for your DevSecOps projects, right? Because you have felt the pain, you know the pain, and we're gonna work on this. Um, what researchers have seen is that the more you feel secure, the, the less you can defend the budget of security <laughs> because nobody really needs to uh, like feels the need for spending so much time on the budget of security. Um, and, and maybe the, the last paradox um, that I've seen is um, we talk a lot about customer centric and being uh, focused on the customer. Uh, a lot of the SaaS companies start out that way, but after a while that customer gets reduced to the main customer that brings in the money and all the other customers they don't care too much about anymore so it's kind of this kind of you do a lot of effort and then you get pushed back uh, on the same ideas and it's it's interesting to think about these paradoxes how we try to get better at things so how do you so the better you get at something the less you fail and the less you fail, you forget how to fall. You get you forget how to fail. How can a security, or if you have gotten really good at security, you have all the vulnerability scanning, you have all the good practices, I, I don't know, whatever it takes to do DevSecOps, how do you maintain a culture of, how do you not only keep your budget, how do you make sure that your team and your organization remains secure and doesn't fall into that paradox? It's, um, if I take the, uh, the comparison from uh, DevOps, where we started introducing things like chaos engineering uh, or resilience engineering, uh, it's it's uh, spending time to overcome your own biases. Uh, and what you see is that um, the continuous integration and continuous delivery uh, just shifts to continuous learning. And you, you kind of have to have the spirit that if we're doing this today, how can we get better? What can we learn? What are we not seeing? And And so instead of it, you spend the time on building the things all the time. 
you kind of have to spend the time on the maintenance. Um, you sometimes see this in development as well. Uh, new developers, they use a lot of external libraries and they add a lot of stuff. And more senior people, they know when to balance, when to add something, when to remove something, and when to write something themselves. So it, it's kind of on this learning path on what, what they consider important for that context uh, that they should keep on training and, and not be uh, unprepared for when things fail. So it sounds like this is these disciplines you're talking about, the, a lot of the DevOps themed ones, would you say that it's important to understand, to not just have somebody come in and set up automation and just have somebody come in and set up security and then you never have to worry about it again, uh, how important is understanding why DevOps principles exist? Has that been important in organizations in your experience? It's, it's interesting. Um, the, the learning curve uh, for somebody uh, adopting new things. Um, if you don't know anything about automation, it's really beneficial to have somebody come in that knows more about it and to have it, uh, you know, learn to you. Um, but that person only has seen uh, certain contexts, uh, certain setups. It, it cannot be blindly used in your company. So you uh, really need to understand the context. And the context is important, for example, what to do first, because we can do a million things, but do, for you to understand what to do first is probably you understand in the context of your own company. Um, I see a lot of companies just blindly putting up um, CI pipelines and automation uh, deployments. Uh, but I sometimes then ask them, why are you doing this? Uh, because everybody else does this, right? And we can faster this deploy. And that comes back to the same question to the silos, right? If your answer to better collaboration is to build an automation system so we don't need to talk anymore, then I don't think that's the best way to go forward. Um, and one of the thought experiments I asked them is, um, imagine your CI system uh, would fail. Uh, sorry, if your CI system uh, is working and your, um, your engineers will be uh, not there for a day, what will happen? All good, it's all working. What if they're not there a week? Well, you know, will it survive? Well, maybe. What if it, they're not there two weeks and you see a lot of people getting uneasy? Uh, mm -hmm. By the way, these type of questions come from Joel Allspaw on resilient engineering. I did not invent them. But the, the main idea is that um, if your CI system would not be there, do the people still know what to do? Uh, and that means only then it is embedded into the people knowledge and what they need to do and why they're doing this. If they understand the why, they will still act the correct way uh, even without a CI pipeline. Uh, but if you didn't explain the why, then there will be lost. Um, I learned this firsthand. Uh, I built up a pipeline with the developers and they really liked it and so on. All of a sudden, a new paradigm comes along, serverless. Mm -hmm. They could now deploy it very easily themselves. And what I saw is that they skipped everything. They skipped the version control. They skipped the testing <laughs> because they could immediately go to production. And then I realized I did not explain why we are doing this because if I had explained this way better, instead of just setting up the pipeline and forcing them to do this, then they might have thought this true. And even with serverless, use the pipeline also. So this is this ends up being about 
you know, going back to what DevOps is, a lot of it is training on process, training on understanding why these tools, why these automations and collaborations help remove the friction between departments, between units, between people, as opposed to somebody set up a thing that I just have to press a button and I never have to think about what that button does. Um, you would say that's not, uh, that's not the right way to go about the culture change in an organization. Correct. Um, otherwise, I, I, in English, there is a, they call it a shell game. You're just, you know, it's a game with three balls and two uh, kind of, well, the cups, and then you kind of have to juggle uh, around it and see wh where the ball is. Um, you're just shifting complexity <laughs> around mm -hmm. and you're not solving the complexity. Um, I, I've seen this, for example, in, I, I know Sam has given a, uh, a talk around microservices. Uh, when microservices came along, uh, a lot of the developers were really excited about, oh, I can really focus on this one function. Uh, it's really gonna help me. Uh, and the operational people also liked it because it was a very limited kind of deploy unit for deploying microservices. The problem that happened is that developers only needed to care about a function and a one thing. But when all these microservices needed to work together, the complexity of understanding that whole system got, got loaded on the operational person because the, the, the complexity was just enormous to understand what was going on now uh, amongst all these services. Instead, when we had the mono, you know, you know everything one was contained into that one service. So that is just an example how we in our industry are just like shifting around complexity uh, in a way that uh, we we're, we're not, not always solving the exact problem uh, that we're, we're focused on. Yeah, I, I, I really love that example. And it's something that we'll be talking about uh, tomorrow. And uh, hopefully, if you have time, you know, we'd love to, to get you to join. Uh, Sam will be joining us, uh, uh, Sam Newman, for uh, monoliths, uh, decomposing monoliths into microservices. And the, the part that I love about that, too, is um, taking one big monolith that has a thousand modules and is very complex and bring into a thousand little modules that are very complex. And now, you know, one big problem to a thousand little problems. They're both, uh, you know, shifting complexity is, is, a, is a hard thing. Um, like you said, a shell game. Uh, so one, one thing before, you know, I get too, too off track, I definitely want to encourage, uh, you know, I've got a, a, you know, we could talk all day and I have a, a hundred questions I could ask, but I'd love to hear from some of the folks here, whether, um, you know, online in the, in the room with Japanese speaking. So, uh, uh, yeah, if <laughs> anyone has questions, uh, Hi, Kaguchi desu. あ、質問させていただきたいです。日本語で質問させてください。よろしいでしょうか。あ、イエス、プリーズ、プリーズ。はい、あの、素晴らしい話、お話ありがとうございます。すごく、えっと、ちょっと感動しながら聞いてました。
、僕、非常に驚いたんですね。えっと、日本だと、えっと、実はソフトウェアをや,でやっているそのシステムインテグレーターという人たちが結構いるんですけど、そソフトウェアやってる人たちがこういうイベントに割と来ることは想像できたんですけど、まあ、日本だと銀行の人、まあ、多少たまに来るかな。えー、病院の人は見たことがないです。で、これは、えー、とヨーロッパではもう普通の話だあつまり一般の IT じゃなくてこういろんなものが統合していて、もう病院でも IT が大事であって、で病院の多分 CEO も IT が大事だと理解をしているという状況が、まあ、そのジュネーブにはあるのかなというふうに僕私は感じたんですけど、これっていうのはそのパトリックさんがこの10年、少し、えー、デボプスを、えー、ベルギーで見られていて、えー、どう変わってきたかでっていうのを教えていただけますか。それから、えー、私たち日本はまだ変わってないと、東京は変わってないので、えー、と社内には、えー、会社のマネジメント層、偉い人の層がいて、えー、この人たちは基本的にあんまり IT のことがわからないので、えー、ちゃんと説明するときに、えー、メタファーとか、えー隣の会社もやってますよとかっていう説明をせざるを得ないエンジニアの人がたくさんいます。で、この人たちをどうやったらその分からない人に説明する苦労から解放してあげられるかっていうのをずっと私この3年ぐらい考えてるんですけど、いいアイディアがあれば教えてください。And hopefully, you were able to catch all that.、Uh, uh, Patrick, did that come through okay? Oh, you might be muted for on your I, end. I'm really sorry, but I only、oh. heard the Japanese version. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, oh, that's, oh, no problem. No problem. So, I will do my best to remember the English <laughs> version.、Um, パトリックさんの、えー、っと通訳設定が多分オフになっていると思います。パトリック、could you set your Zoom menu? Oh, Patrick, can you hear Japanese or English now?、Um, the last sentence was in English and before that everything was Japanese. Oh, sorry.、Uh, yeah, Patrick's now talking, but I can't hear him. Sorry for the technical difficulties.、Uh, but yeah.、Um, uh, Patrick, son, could you set in your Zoom menu、uh, the, in the translation,、uh, interpretation menu and set English? Okay, I've switched to English now. Yes. もう一回だけ、ちょっと通訳さんと申しますね。Yes, I can hear you now. シンプルに言うと、あの、I apologize、えー、for not pressing the button. ジュネーブに、<笑>ジュネーブにの、その、デボプスデイズの、あ、ごめんなさい、えっと、ベルギーのヘントに、えー、おととし、えー、デボプスデイズの10周年の、えー、オーガナイザーのミーティングがあって、そこに私参加させていただいたんですけど、そこで出会ったジュネーブのデボプスデイズのえー、オーガナイザーの人がいました。で、この人が言っていたのは、最近、デボプスデイズにジュネーブで参加するのはどんな人って聞いたら、病院の人、銀行の人、時計メーカーの人っていうふうにおっしゃってるんですね。これが私、非常にびっくりしまして。で、日本だとおそらくソフトウェアを作ってる会社の方が、まあ、割とこちらに、えー、デボプスデイズに来ることが多くて、えー、銀行は見たこと、あんまり見たことないし、えー、病院は一度も会ったことがないと。あ時計メーカーの方は、えー、多少いらっしゃいます。はい、確かに日本も時計メーカー多いので,、はいで,で。それは、えっと、この10年少し、えっとえっと、ヨーロッパでデボプスを,をデボプスを見てこられて、ヨーロッパの中での,その変化というのは、どういうふうにこう企業ごとどういうふうに来たのかというのを教えていただきたいのが質問1つ目。もう1つの質問は、東京ではまだそういう状況になってないんですけど、ってことは、各企業の皆さん、えー、今日来てるような皆さんの会社には、えー、私はデボプスをやろうとしてるんだけど、えー、会社のトップ、えー、マネジメント、それから会社のマネージャーの人たちの一部、あ大多数かな、マネージャーたちはデボプスのことがわからないので
、彼らにちゃんと理解してもらうために、えー、彼らは IT すらわからないので、えー、分かるようにメタファーを使ったりとか、頑張ってこう説,説明をしているんですね、の IT の人たちは。でその苦労からちょっと解放してあげたいと私いつも思っていて、この3年ぐらいずっと思ってるんですけど、どうやったらその彼らをそのちゃんとエンジニアリングする、あの説明役、わからない人への説明役ではなくて、ちゃんとエンジニアリングする人に、えー、集中させてあげるにはどうしたらいいかっていうのを、えー、考えてるんですけど、アドバイスがあれば教えてください。Okay, thank you very much、uh, for the question. I, I now understood.、Uh, so, if I understand it right, there's actually two questions.、Uh, one is about、uh, the DevOps days、um, having a different audience in different parts of the world.、Um, I, my view on it is that when people organize DevOps days, they often tap into a local community. Uh, that they're already connected to. And、uh, that makes that some events are more development centric, more are, some are more business centric,、uh, some are more engineering centric.、Um, so that means、um, he's doing signals. Is that for me? Sorry. Ooh, sorry. Oh, no, okay. I just wanted、ah. to be zoomed. Okay, like perfect.、That. Yeah.、Um, and that, that leaves that.、Uh, The organizers actually bring most of the initial network, and that gets amplified by friends that come along and the promotion and the, the kind of the networks and that. So it isn't that much, I think,、uh, of the concept of DevOps days. It's more of the network that's already there and that is get tapped into.、Uh, in Switzerland, uh, there's, uh, they came of it from a financial institution. A lot of the original organizers of the DevOps days already had that network. So that means they bring along kind of this uh, people uh, with FinOps uh, and uh, kind of banks being the predominant uh, uh, part. In,、um, for example, Australia, it's more developer focused.、Um, in, uh, in, in China, again, it is more about、uh, the technology. So, Again, it's the network.、Um, the second question,、uh, if、um, I heard, was that you have a hard time explaining why DevOps is useful to management, why we should be doing this.、Um, it, it is a struggle that I've seen everywhere,、mm-hmm. um, but I've seen it change、uh, through books like the,、uh, the, the Phoenix Project. The unicorn project that Gene Kim has written, because it is kind of translated into a little bit of the theory of constraints with success stories of big companies also doing it.、Um, I'm, I'm not saying this is the best approach, but at least it is translated into business speak more than、uh, we are often at the practitioner level、uh, on a DevOps days.、Uh, and that's、uh, where it helps.、Um, I personally also learned that if you have a hard time explaining why collaboration is a good thing,、uh, you have to start thinking、uh, if you're not、um, discussing at the belief level. Because if, if somebody still believes that everything can be solved with automation, And there is no need for collaboration, and we can write the perfect specifications for people to implement, and there is no need for collaboration.、Uh, then we have a different worldview. I think that is the shift of we assume failure, we assume everything cannot be done by technology, we assume that by diversity and by collaboration, we can do better things.、Um, and that's An assumption that, again, we believe is better, and we will find you the proof that it is better. But I know people will also find the proof that you don't need it. And they will show you that by all the automation, I can get more efficiency. And why spend all the time collaborating、um, 
in doing this. Um, just maybe as a final quote, um, Damon Edwards, who has been there from the beginning in DevOps days, and he was much talking to business people around the concept of introducing DevOps. And I remember a story about him going into a big manufacturer and he was talking about all these efficiencies and all these improvements. Uh, and the big, you know, the, the, the kind of CEO person just said, this looks interesting, but if I just raise the price of my product with a couple of 10 mm -hmm. cents, mm -hmm. I will get the same improvements. So we, we can also not mm -hmm. exaggerate the improvements that we can produce, uh, we have to stay honest. Uh, but I think for me, me personally, DevOps is not about the efficiency. Uh, for me, I'm, I am a community person. That's why I started DevOps days. Um, DevOps is about having not constant arguments and having a nicer way while working and having a better life while working. Um, and obviously, if your company is not in, you know, interested <laughs> in your well-being and only in the efficiency, uh, you will have the hard uh, problem. Um, I believe you already had a talk on mob programming. Uh, they have the same problem. Why is it more efficient to have seven people in a room working all day on the same problem? Well, one thing you don't know is that the knowledge is shared. We can be much faster on the handoffs uh, and we can solve problems together with multiple views uh, and, and get better at this. The opposite people will say, this is not the most efficient way. Why is everybody working, spending their time being idle when they need to be idle? And that is, again, it's a belief system, uh, but I do believe this collaboration is kind of more efficient in the long run. And more has to do with the fact that you cannot predict things. We like to think in metaphors of manufacturing and kind of, kind of uh, this automated process. But these days, software development is so complex, it's not standardized, it's changing all the time that it is not that mechanical kind of we do A and then B happens and then C happens. A lot has to do of changing how we do things, learning from it, adapting, doing something else, trying uh, and working on that. And that is, as far as I know, collaboration is the best form to do that. I hope oh, this answers your question. That's a great answer. Yeah, thank you. Um, and hopefully next time you can come in person and then we can talk about how to establish collaboration in Japanese organizations. It is a surprising challenge uh, to, to do that. And I think you gave a great point that we can't implement DevOps inside of a company that doesn't value collaborative uh, and collaboration approaches. So that makes, um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, let's, let's see, does it, uh, are there any other questions um, that, that are out there? Um, you know, if anyone has a question, uh, please. Actually, I don't know the technical. Ah, yes. あ、はい。えっと、で、毎回感じる、あの、ことをすればいいのか。ま、ちなみにあの、兵士私のところですと 
、えっと、アンケートをしてます。<笑>で、そのアンケートを分析して、えっと、どういうふうなフィードバックをお客が、で、こう、えー、やっていこうかっていう形でモニタリングしてるんですけど、まあ、いかにもアナログですよね。えっと、この辺のところって、えー、そこが結局ボトルネックになってしまうかもしれないなと思いまして、まあ、そこら辺の議論って、どのようになってるでしょうかはい。The CI pipeline and automation are related, but not always the same because、uh, some things、uh, are automated outside of the CI pipeline,、uh, and the CI pipeline itself needs to be automated、uh, mm. in, a, in, in several cases.、Um, I, I'm going to answer with a, a story about,、um, about Microsoft.、Um, I think it was OneNote or one of、mm. their products.、Um, They really decided to do this very agile、um, and to have a quick、oh. release and to deliver this into a public.、Um, and they wanted to get the feedback. And what happened、mm -hmm. is a product that had been running for many years that they just improved, when they added the feedback button,、um, Their system that、mm. had to handle the feedback crashed over to、oh. the load.、Uh, because if you are not serious about getting the feedback and you don't build the mechanisms in, then you will not get the feedback and you will only get your own、mm. thinking. But if you really open this up、mm. and are not afraid to do this,、uh, then you will get a lot of feedback. But、uh, the difference is between I have an、mm. ear. And you can shout at me, or am I willing to listen to it?、Um, there is, of course, also if you get a lot of feedback, you have to triage and monitor and filter. So it is sometimes really mm -hmm, scary mm -hmm. to understand、right. uh, what to do first with the feedback.、Uh, but I, I think the feedback is the、mm -hmm. only way that you can keep learning. Otherwise, you have just gone from A to B, and how do you know how to improve?、Um, mm. I don't know if that answers your question. Hi. Thank you. You're welcome. So,、um, we have, let's see, we are, we are coming close to the time, but I think that we have、uh, maybe time for one more. For one more question, if,、uh, if someone would like to jump in,、um, anyone out there? I can't actually see you、uh, joining us remotely, but I'm picturing that someone out there is wanting to raise their hand or unmute and join.、Um, ah, yes. Hi, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, 最初の川口さんの質問と似てるんですがなかなか本を読めと言ってもみんな読まないし勉強しろと言ってもやっぱり勉強する人ばかりではないそんな中で何て言うかグレースフルにデブオプスのカルチャーを広めるのがすごく難しいと感じています何かどう一歩一歩は踏み出せるかもしれないけど三歩ぐらいを踏み出す時の何かポイントってありますか Thank you for your question.、Um, 
so how do I um, get people started when they don't want to read books or they, they are, don't want to listen? Um, obviously, that's, that is really hard. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, when, when people come to me with uh, these kind of questions, I say, well, they're not interested how I can, can I convince them and, uh, you know, that this is a better way and we should do something like this. Um, they often put the kind of the, uh, the burden to the other person saying, well, they are not learning, they are not doing this. Um, so you have to turn to yourself, like you say, what can we ourselves do better? Um, I, I can ask you a couple of questions. Um, if, if they're not interested in doing this, could it be that we're not actually solving a pain that exists? Or are we not formulating a pain that they feel? Because if, if they don't feel that there's something that needs to be improved or that helps them, we can ask everybody. Um, I have three children and the best way to have them do something <laughs> is not by saying you should do something. <laughs> um, but once they learned that they had a problem, that I hope they will come to me and then I can give them advice. But as long as they don't have had the problem, they don't feel the problem, I did not explain the problem well to them. Um, I can tell them everything I want, but they will not listen. Uh, so the advice in this case I would give you is that really, really talk to that person and try to listen and find out besides DevOps, outside DevOps, don't mention even DevOps, what is the problems you are facing today? Where can I help you? Um, DevOps is not a solution for everything. Um, and it, like I say, if it's a problem they're not feeling, they don't care about, like, or it doesn't change, like in the example with the money, if it's only a few cents, why are we changing everything that we believe in? Um, it does not make sense. Um, so the burden on showing value is actually on you. <laughs> um, and that means that either you do something, you show that you've improved something drastically, you help them, uh, but, and then obviously if they don't see your work or they don't appreciate your work, you have another problem. That is not a DevOps problem. But if you see the progress, you help the person to overcome a problem they have, you will go a long way in actually kind of bridging the problem space uh, of them being um, interested in your advice. Um, there is, uh, if you want to create trust between the two that, you know, that person should listen to you for that advice, uh, there's a couple of things. You can show that you're competent by doing your work really well. You can show that you are really um, committed to it, that you do this every time you say the same things, you kind of are there when they need you. And then you also can show that you care. And the care is a lot of it is about understanding how they think, how they understand things, uh, how, what problems they have. And this is not going to be solved by a technology we change. And even if you change the technology, that problem will still remain. So the best advice is just to ask good questions like, what problems do you want me to solve? If it's not this, where can I help you? Where can I help you? What value can I bring to you? Um, and hopefully that gives you a better focus on where to spend your automation efforts, where to spend uh, any of the work you are doing, uh, because they will see immediate value in there. 
Thank you for your question again. It's a very good question. Oh, that's a yeah, wonderful question and, and great answer. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Patrick. Um, so we are uh, 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 we are a little bit over, but I think that that's okay. This has been a, a wonderful session. Um, you know, Patrick, if there's anything you'd like to leave us with, uh, closing thoughts or something, I know that everyone has been uh, very appreciative of, of you um, joining us in your early morning and uh, you know sharing some you know lots of advice and information. It's been it's been wonderful. So thank you so much for that. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, if there's one thing I learned that, that it's really not easy. <laughs> so if you feel that you're alone, you have a hard time for this, I can totally relate. Uh, I still feel this uh, when I go into engagements or companies. Uh, but the idea that we might change something for the good and we did change something for the good, uh, that is what keeps me going. And I, I, I hope this gives you uh, also enough strength to keep trying, keep going uh, and make the effort of making this, uh, you know, your, your job and other people's job more humane uh, and kind of collaboratively uh, in that sense. Um, I, I do hope to be someday in Tokyo <laughs> uh, and I hope you will have me uh, at that time uh, and uh, congratulations on this event again. Uh, it shows really how this whole community has come you know, back up again after these hard times um, and uh, good luck with the rest of the conference. And uh, thank you, Alex, the translators, the people asking questions, the people attending. Uh, thank you for, uh, very much to making this yet another great DevOps days uh, uh, today. Uh, thanks, Patrick. We really appreciate it and look forward to having you in Tokyo. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Patrick, Alex, thank you very much. Hi.皆様どうもありがとうございました。これにてDevopsDays Tokyo 2021。えー、デイ1、え、すべての講演が終了となります。え、皆様ご参加いただき誠にありがとうございました。